brothers and sisters in Christ, as we continue our journey to the Divine Liturgy, this series of homilies, we called it last week, we spoke about how the Divine Liturgy is our ascent to the Kingdom, about how the Liturgy is the place where heaven and earth come together, it's the place where we as the body of Christ come together in all fullness to encounter God. The Divine Liturgy is the place where we begin to live the reality of the Kingdom of God here and now. Today we'll focus our attention on the first half of the liturgy. The liturgy can be thought of as consisting of two main parts. The first half known as the liturgy of the Word, the liturgy of the catechumens, the early church that was the part of the catechumens we be present for. The second half is called the liturgy of the faithful. These two parts, of course, are inseparably linked. The divine liturgy is not two, but one. So we shouldn't take these divisions too far. Nonetheless, the point of unity throughout is the Word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. The first half of the liturgy culminates in the proclamation of the Word of God in the Gospel reading that we just heard, and in its distribution and reception in the homily. And the second half of the liturgy culminates in the sacrament of the Word made flesh, in the distribution and reception of the body and blood of Christ, the God, the Word incarnate, in the Holy Eucharist. So in other words, we partake of the Word of God, Jesus Christ, in both, in both parts, we commune with him in the first and the second half, but in different ways. In different ways. Now let's take a step back for a minute and consider how worship took place in the Old Testament before the coming of Christ. Now God had ordained that there be a single place where sacrifices could be offered for the sins of the people and for thanksgiving. And this was at first the tabernacle in the Sinai Desert, and then later in the temple in Jerusalem. For geographic reasons, it wasn't possible for all Jews to make a journey to Jerusalem every single Sabbath day. Instead, they would customarily gather in the synagogue in their town to pray at a service at a service that consisted primarily of singing psalms, reading the scriptures, the law, and the prophetic books, and hearing a sermon and exposition about these things. While well, the temple, on the other hand, was the place of sacrifice. Of course, the Old Testament was animal sacrifice. We'll talk about we'll talk about. Uh, that more next, next week. But it was about some place of sacrifice. Well, the synagogue was the place where the Word of God was read. Now, for us as Orthodox Christians, all, all the Old Testament finds its fulfillment and completion in the New, in Jesus Christ. The Orthodox Divine Liturgy is the fulfillment in Christ of both the, the worship of the synagogue and of the temple. The synagogue worship being parallel to the first half of the liturgy, the liturgy of the Word, and the temple worship finding its fulfillment in the second half of the Liturgy of the Faithful. And I said, but God grants, we'll, we'll discuss that next week. But as we mentioned, the synagogue worship consists especially of singing psalms, prayers, readings, and explanation of the Word of God, and this is the basic structure that we just experienced, the first half of the liturgy. And after the Great Litany, after the Great Litany, we sing several hymns called antiphons, and these are usually psalms that we just heard. Bless the Lord, O my soul, praise the Lord, O my soul, then we sing the Beatitudes. They're usually the same on most Sundays, but on great feast days they can, they can also vary. Um, the name Antiphon, it comes from a style of singing, a style of, of, of worship that was widespread in the church, involving a, either a call and response or often two choirs that would sing a verse back and forth, one choir than the other. That's where this name comes from. But more than that, you, you may have heard this question, about, I've heard it before, that is it, if it gets repetitive to pray the same prayers and sing those same psalms week after week. I can say for myself, I hope for you, that it actually doesn't. We hear these familiar words, it brings a certain joy to our hearts. We strive to pray them deeply within ourselves. We know the next word is coming. It facilitates that, entering into it, our minds, our hearts, and the words. For some of you who experience, I know there's some, some newer people here, or you can remember if, if, you, you, are new, if you didn't grow up in the church, uh, when you first come to the liturgy, or you first came to the liturgy, it can be a, a disorienting. Kind of, there's all this singing and movement going on, but what is it? You feel a little lost. But, but what happens is that little by little, the more you come, maybe after the third week, the fourth week, you start to find your feet a little bit. You start to kind of get a sense of this. And, it, and in fact, this familiarity helps us to really enter into the, those, those prayers more easily. The more we enter into these prayers, the more we realize that Jesus Christ, the proclamation of His Gospel, is at the heart of of the Divine Liturgy. When we look around inside an Orthodox Church, so you, you walk in the door right now, what, what do you first notice that your attention is drawn toward? The architecture, everything facilitates this. We're immediately drawn forward, drawn forward to this area, which we would see the royal doors, and if the royal doors open like right 
everybody else. You, you see it's right in the middle of the table. Table in the center, the altar table. The altar. And what is it that sits at the very center of the altar table right now? We see it's standing right up. The, the, book, the book of the Gospels. The book of the Gospels. And in fact, for us, what's very interesting is it's not the entire Bible. It's not even the New Testament. But it is the book of the four Gospels that especially tell the life and contain the words of our Lord and Jesus Christ. And so we see very symbolically and literally the Word of God is at the center. It's at the center of our worship. And during the, the, the little entrance, the small entrance, with the Gospel book, which we had just a little bit ago, um, with this procession, the Gospel book is brought to the center of the church. Uh, for us, when the priest is sitting in the center up here, when the bishop is here, to the very center of the church. And we sing, uh, well, we first proclaim, Wisdom, let us attend. And then we, we, we sing the hymn, or stand up right, another translation. Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ our God. Oh, before Christ, O Son of God, risen from the dead, save us who sing to thee. Alleluia. Our whole attention, our whole focus, our worship is on Jesus Christ. Then we sing, so this followed by singing of hymns to commemorate the day. For Sunday, we always sing about the resurrection. Uh, we sing about the saints or the event of the day. For today, protection of the Theotokos, we sing about. We always remember what our church is dedicated to, to us the cross. The Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. And after the singing, remember not long ago, comes the, 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 the hymn of the thrice holy, the thrice holy hymn, which is nothing other than the angelic hymn that we've encountered in, in Scripture several times. When we have the angelic vision in Isaiah, as well as in the book of Revelation, the vision of heaven opening the angels, the cherubim, singing this thrice holy hymn, holy, holy, holy. And for us, we have the hymn, holy God, holy might, and holy Lord, have mercy on us. But I want you to just remind ourselves of this angelic worship. I quote briefly from Isaiah. The prophet said, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and above it stood the seraphim, he described the seraphim, and goes on. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of thy glory. This is where we are. We realize the cherubim here, above, above, around the throne, around the altar table, as we're singing with the angels this thrice holy hymn. And then comes the proclamation of the word, first from the Acts of the Apostles in one of the New Testament epistles, and then a reading from the gospel itself. Before we read the Gospel, uh, the priest prayers a prayer on behalf of all of us. It's usually silent, but I want you to, to hear this prayer again. Listen to this. Before we read the Gospel, we pray, Illumine our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our minds to the understanding of thy Gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, the trembling of all carnal desires when we enter upon a spiritual manner of living both thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies of Christ our God. And to thee we send up glory, together with thy Father from everlasting, and all holy good and life and in spirit. It's a beautiful prayer. It's one that we can pray at home too. In fact, many Orthodox prayer books have this as a prayer you can read before, or a prayer to pray before you read the Holy Scriptures. But during the Gospel reading, we, of course we all stand, so we're all standing with great, with great attention. We strive to really hear those words, to let them sink in. And as we said, the proclamation of the gospel is the climax, the climax of that first part of the liturgy of the word. And this is ordinarily followed by, by the homily, right? Which explains and expounds upon the day's gospel reading. We heard it to kind of know an Orthodox homeless is not free to speak whatever he wishes. He's not free to kind of just get up here and say, say whatever I'd like to say in a certain sense. This implies very strongly to a seminary in our tradition that the homeless is to proclaim the unchanging gospel. On the one hand, consistent with uh, the interpretations that have been handed down by the Holy Fathers and the saints throughout the centuries, the preaching the one and the same gospel, but also it tri striving it to be in a language that's clear and, and applicable to, you know, to, uh, to us from modern circumstances. Not changing that, but trying to uh, to explain that, to deliver that one and the same message. But in fact, it's a little bit un unusual, you could say, by preaching on, more so on the, on the liturgy, oh, God, God, God forgive me, but it's, usually we, we say we preach the gospel, we explain it and in the way that's been handed down, the faith handed down. Because for us, and this is the important point, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is always new. 
It's always relevant, it's always contemporary, without any need to artificially or, or, or in some way try to uh, make, it, make it be so, to make it be up to date. We don't need to do any of that. We don't need any gimmicks. The gospel itself, the more that we just preach it, that is what reaches the heart. That is what transforms. That's what has the power. And so the more that we hold close to this faith once delivered to the saints, the more it has the power to reach us and to move our hearts. And so, so on that hand, it also becomes less about you know, the preacher's ability, how good it is or not. You should know that you're going to an Orthodox church, you're going to hear the faith expound, the Orthodox faith proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness. And we need this. We need this more and more. Because the messages that we hear when, we, when we're out, out in our day-to-day -day life, right, the messages of the world, of society, of, of, of school, of work, of culture, whatever it may be, right, so often, on one hand, it, it falls short. There could be good things there, but in some ways we see that it either falls short or it can be completely at odds or deceptive or something completely other entirely. But how do we really know how do we just make that discernment? What is right and what is wrong? What misses the mark and what doesn't? How do we act in different situations? Unless we really know the, the words of the gospel deeply, unless we've taken the words of Jesus Christ deep into ourselves. And for us, it means to be steeped in it all the time so that we don't forget. Reading the scriptures daily at home and especially really attending to them at, at, at the liturgy, at the services of the church. I just think that this is an example today. We take today's short gospel reading at the beginning. Jesus commands us not just to love those who love us, but to love even those who don't. Where in the world are you going to hear a message like that? At a time when the world is always looking for someone to blame, someone to cancel or to cut off if they don't agree with me or have the right, have the right views in every situation, always looking to, as I say, to divide, to cut off, to fight, whatever it may be. Jesus tells us this isn't the way. This isn't the way. We're not to overcome evil with evil, but with goodness and long-suffering and love. Here are his words again. Right. He says to you, the disciples, he says, don't follow the ways of the world. Listen, love your enemies. Do good and lend, not hoping for anything in return. That's pretty radical. And your reward is great, will be great, and you will be sons and daughters of the Most High. That's your reward who is kind even to the unthankful and evil. He says, look at this. God is kind even to those who are unthankful and evil. He's generous even to them. Be like Him. Be like God. Therefore, be merciful even as your Heavenly Father is merciful. Where else will you hear such radical and yet such life-giving words? Be not conformed to this world, St. Paul reminds us, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by hearing and reflecting on the inspired words of Scripture that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. May our Lord Jesus Christ, through the prayers of His most pure mother, who showed us in her life that a transfigured life according to the will of God is indeed possible, and His heavenly protection and intercession remember this day, may our Lord Jesus Christ, through her prayers, help us to understand His words, His holy will, and to give us the strength and the grace and resolve to live His gospel teachings so that we too may be sons and daughters of the Most High. To him be all glory, honor, and worship, together with his fathers from everlasting, his all holy, good, and life giving spirit, now and ever, and through ages of ages. Amen.